Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Granite Rock's Tech Talk Seminar Series. My name is Keith Severson. I'll be your host today. For everyone's information, we will be recording this session in order to grant replay access to those who are unable to attend our live event today. We'll be sending you the ever-popular exit survey in a continuing effort to make these seminars more useful to you. So please uh, fill that out when you get it. As we get started, we ask everyone, of course, to keep yourselves uh, muted and your cameras off. The chat is open, so we encourage questions or comments throughout the meeting. If you happen to have a question, please add it to the chat section and we will try to answer them as soon as possible. We can work it into the into the session and we will watch for your raised hands as well. We've got monitors on both sides here. I'd like to now introduce our first expert speaker, Brandon Millar. He is addressing pavement sustainability and hot mix asphalt. Brandon is the Director of Technical Services for the California Pavement Association and a licensed civil engineer in California. Mr. Millar received his Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. In his current role, he works with asphalt pavement industry owner and agencies throughout California, developing asphalt pavement standards, training of technical personnel, and research of new pavement technologies. For over 25 years, Mr. Millar has provided technical support for processing aggregates, designing and testing of asphalt mixes, constructing asphalt pavements, and implementing innovative pavement technologies. When not working on all things asphalt, he enjoys the exploration of national parks in the western U.S. and golfing. Brandon, I trust you got out and got a little golf going. Photography and sharing a meal with friends and family. Brandon, anything else you'd like to add about yourself, your company, and uh, please unmute and, and take it away. All right, well, thank you all for uh, joining. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you now. All right, so we'll, we're gonna discuss uh, pavement sustainability, the use of wrap uh, in hot mix asphalt. And I'd like to thank uh, thank uh, Granite Rock for the invitation to to join all of you and to discuss uh, RAP and its use in hot mix asphalt. Uh, first off, my name is Brandon Millar, as, as you know, uh, the technical director for the California Asphalt Pavement Association. Our association has been uh, representing the asphalt pavement industry since 1953. We are comprised of member companies in all aspects of asphalt uh, pavement from the mix producers, the material suppliers, contract paving contractors, and we partner and, and collaborate with uh, the various owner agencies throughout the state. Our main focus at CalAPA is, is really summed up in our strategic plan and our four key elements of our strategic plan is uh, promoting, learning, advocating, and networking, all related to asphalt promoting the use of asphalt, uh, learning, providing technical opportunities to share information on asphalt. Advocating is really that's our legislative piece in regards to ensuring that, uh, that uh, our legislators and our, our different partners understand who we are as an industry. Um, and then finally, networking. The most important thing of all of this, um, all of our interactions is that face-to-face -face, um, individual contact uh, with all of our partners and the various stakeholders um, throughout the asphalt pavement industry and providing those through our, F through our, through our uh, various events. Now, when we talk about the use of RAP, let's go back just a little bit. Um, really what we're looking at here is um, a major, major part of our industry's effort to um, to deal with climate stewardship. How do we get to a net zero um, carbon emissions? And so, as a result, we've been we've been working with our Napa partners, uh, the National Asphalt Pavement Association. We've been part of their effort in developing a an industry vision of what that climate stewardship looks like. And that has been titled the road forward. And in this in this uh, road forward effort, 
this vision, it really encapsulates what, as an industry, we want to do um, to achieve um, essentially a net zero carbon emission in 2050. And there's different different ways that um, we can address that and different tactics. What are we going to focus on? What are the goals? Some of the things, and then also we need some accountability on that. What are the activities? How are we going to measure it? Um, what type of research and implementation gaps do we have? These are all of the things that we will um, be working on over the next uh, decades to get to that net zero, that net zero space. And why do I bring that up? It's because what we're here to, to discuss today on the use of RAP um, is a major goal uh, to get us there. And how are we going to do that? We're going to, that goal in, in includes the use of recycled material. Balanced mixed design. Balanced mixed design is a way for us to rethink how we utilize, how we uh, design our asphalt mixes. And then by doing that, we can better uh, understand um, how the incorporation of recycled materials will affect performance long term, because we believe there are ways that we can recycle more in our asphalt pavements and not be um, a negative to the performance, but actually enhance the, the, the pavement performance. So today we're going to focus primarily on wrap. We're going to discuss what wrap is. We're going to we're going to um, try to understand why are we going to use the wrap. What are the benefits for for increasing the use of wrap? And then we're going to we're going to go over engineering a mix with wrap. Just like anything, if you just throw something in and you're not really focused on, not really looking at what effects those uh, components have on your mix. Yeah, you you could you could be helping it, you could be hurting it, and with all of the experience that um, industries, agencies, and engineers um, throughout the decades um, have had using RAP, there are ways to engineer a mix properly to ensure that you don't lose pavement performance, and in some cases, actually improve your performance of the pavement with RAP. So there are different types of recycling in general. Uh, when we when we think about asphalt pavements, and I know uh, many many of you have experience with with some or all of these, there is surface recycling. Um, there's uh, like a hot in place recycling, cold mix recycling. We know that uh, Caltrans and many local agencies here in California are involved in this cold place recycling. Um, that could be in place recycling, or even now you utilizing. Um, the the millings into a central plant recycling so you have a complete 100 uh, percent recycled mix and then finally hma recycling where what do we do we take the wrap from the from the pavement and we utilize in the in the production and placement of new asphalt pavements so what is it essentially what we're looking at is a material that is sourced from our existing roads so what 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 happen, What often happens is is when a road comes to the end of its of its useful life, that road is is removed from the from uh, the roadbed, and it is taken off site, and then new mix is placed. Now this material that's in the roadbed, it's composed of aggregate and asphalt binder, just like air existing, and then. Um, we'll see these stockpiles, especially in urban areas. We'll start to see these stockpiles grow of wrap. Um, and so we need a we need a place to use it. We need a place something to do with it. And so that's where we get into a circle of life. So we start off in the top left where roads come to its end, useful end. It's time to mill it off, mill it out. That gets processed and put into stockpiles. Then it's put into the actual production of new asphalt pavement mix, and then it's laid down. And then after it's laid down, it stays there until through its entire life. Then it's milled back up, put into, and it just keeps going on and on. And that's the that's the benefit here of of utilizing wrap is that we can minimize the need for materials, and we'll get more of, of new materials, and we'll get into that in a little bit later. But you can see this this circle of life for wrap. 
Now, what most people think of when they think of wrap is they'll go to a yard and they may see a pile that looks like this, a wrap stockpile, not very attractive. Chunks, big chunks, small coloration is all over the place. How can you get anything of quality when you're looking at a pile that looks like this? And I think that's where a lot has come into play for our material suppliers, material producers, in how do they manage this material that's come off from an existing pavement. They process it. And processing, especially when we look at um, wrap, very similar process that aggregate producers throughout the state, throughout the country are very familiar with. It's about, it's about taking that material, screening it down into, into various sizes, and also even crushing it down um, breaking up those chunks and then also getting it to something that's more uniform. Uh, this is right down the wheelhouse of 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 our industry and 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 how we manage uh, materials. And the fact that we're dealing with a material that is composed of essentially rock and asphalt binder, it's pretty easy to manage out there. So you can see a single stage that I just showed you where all the material goes across the screen to a single size. We also have much more large scale uh, processing, and this is where they'll actually take the wrap material and what's called fractionating, fractionate it into different um, size materials that are stockpiled separately, and then they can be incorporated into the mix and have a lot more control over the gradation and the quality of the, of the, of the overall mix by managing uh, the various stockpiles of material sizes. Stockpiling, obviously, when you're dealing with uh, with a uh, material like wrap or even aggregates, the way that a stockpile is done, it's important to understand that to minimize segregation, how it's loaded out of the stockpile, whether it's through feeders underneath the stockpile or even from a from a front end loader that loads into a hopper. Uh, you know, though this is something that's done on a regular basis to ensure consistency and quality. And so what happens, what does that material look like? Here's a picture of a half inch minus wrap um, finished product. As you can see, it looks pretty uniform. It looks fairly clean, you know, and that's the nice thing. We went from that big, ugly, massive, chunky pile that you wonder what the heck are we gonna do with this stuff? And now you look at it, it looks like uh, the virgin aggregates, the, the sizing of the virgin aggregates that we use on a regular basis for, for asphalt mixes. So that's what makes it very easy for us to size it down so that we can easily incorporate it into the asphalt mixes. So kind of touched on this uh, a little bit up to this point, it's why do we use it? That first one, it's a source of material to produce asphalt mixes. What is it composed of? Once again, aggregate and binder. The same type of aggregates, the same type of binders that we use in our hot mixes. Uh, in fact, if you look at those in a, in a specific region, it's probably coming from the same pits and the same binder suppliers that an agency has been using for decades. So that's there's some um, consistency in there, and it's usually coming off of a road especially a public works road, state or, or local agency that was using a specification that was requiring a special, a, a specific uh, quality of material. Also, there's the environmental side, um, reducing waste to landfill. Even though I say reduce waste to landfill, the reality is wrap really never makes it to a landfill. If it does, it's really being used at the landfill um, to help build the roads around the landfill, but not really just getting dumped. It's too valuable of a material. What else does it do environmentally? It reduces the demand, the need for material extraction, production, and transportation. Uh, this is, think of that from an aggregate side. It reduces the demand on our precious aggregates that we have here in the state. It also reduces the demand for um, asphalt binder, 
the petroleum product that's in our in our mixes. So it re reduces the demand for that. And then finally, on the environmental side, it reduces emissions because what it's doing is you reduce the emissions from all of this, uh, from the reduction of the material extraction. You can think of that from the virgin aggregates and even the, the binders, but it also reduces emissions in the material because in the material mix production, because you're you're uh, just through a volume standpoint, you don't have to do a lot of the processing that you are at the at the um, hot plant in regards to heating and drying. It's a little less uh, intensive from that from that standpoint. And then you also reduce material um, from hauling hauling the material to and from um, uh, to and from the the hot plant. And then what do we see from a performance standpoint? Straight off the board, it's an improvement. It's an improvement on uh, resistant to per permanent deformation, uh, resistance to um, to rutting. There is a as a result of that. There's the other side of it that we have to manage, which is the cracking, and that's really where when we get into how do we engineer it, is using various techniques to ensure that while we have a rut resistant mix, that we also have a crack resistant mix, and that's gonna that's going to um, to improve the longevity of those mixes. I want to bring up this aggregate availability because this is really a something that we have to deal with in California, uh, and, and it's about permitted reserves. Uh, we have aggregate reserves throughout the state. Uh, some of them are permitted. Some of them, those those reserves are identified. They just haven't been um, permitted or or accessed as of yet. Um, so those have been identified throughout the state. Uh, that's in a in a map. Uh, so the mapping that is done through um, through um, our friends at the Geologic Survey uh, identifies the different types of aggregates, the quality of the uh, aggregates, and then looks at supply and demand. And I think that's an important thing because when we look at in a specific region, how much rock do we have available for the construction market, for for instance. So when we look here in, in, in California, we're looking at construction materials. Um, we have some areas that have a lot of aggregate, don't have to worry about it. And then we have some areas that um, in a very short period of time, uh, definitely well within um, our lifetimes, they're just gonna run out. And so how can we best manage those aggregates uh, to get the biggest value for from them in regards to um, how we use them in construction. And then in order to stretch the life of those permitted reserves, we look at utilizing uh, recycling strategies. You know, there, it's been said that some of the best uh, aggregates for road buildings are already in our roads. We just need to utilize those. Um, and so that's really what we're looking at here. How do we address the demand for aggregates? So a lot of folks ask, OK, well, how much wrap are we actually using? Um, you know, I, we look around California, maybe it doesn't look as much as, um, you know, how can we grow this in California? Other states are using quite a bit more wrap. Uh, when we look at the most recent uh, survey from the National Asphalt Pavement Association on the wrap usage, here we see about 20 um, for 2020, 87 million tons of wrap used. Um, that's a pretty good sized number. What does that really equate to? What are some other ways that we can look at that 87 million tons? Um, that's 24 million barrels uh, of oil in a year. 93% um, um, of all of the material that comes off of our end of life asphalt pavements is going back into new pavements. That's a pretty significant number. And then 2.3 million metric tons. That's from an from a emission standpoint, that's the amount of CO2 spared um, from going into the atmosphere just because of the use of wrap. Um, those are big numbers and those are significant. And we all know that here in California, we have significant goals on addressing our material usage and also reducing our greenhouse gases um, for all of our different industries uh, throughout this state. And this is just one way that we can do that. Hey, Brandon. So when I we look at engineering Brandon, mixes. Can you hear me? 
um, with RAP, this is where we get into how do we deal with our challenges. So when we look at performance, we look at reading. Um, you know, if we, you know, one of the concerns that we have for, and, and, and a lot of folks here in California have recognized that we definitely, we don't necessarily have a high running problem in California. Um, what we have is mostly cracking, and that's by design, by the type of the way we design our mixes. Um, so what happens when we start to look at performance of high wrap mixes? Um, we typically don't have an issue with rutting because what, what we find with the aggregate um, and the binders that we have in our wrap tends to be, the binder tends to be a lot stiffer than what we typically use. Um, so the stiffer binders does make it a little bit more resilient to rutting. When we do look at though for engineering, something engineering a mix, we have to be concerned that our strategies we use to make it resistant to cracking um, doesn't make our mixes overly soft. And so that's something we have to find the balance of the different additives that we may use um, to help with the, um, with the cracking that it's not too much that it leads to a writing problem. We also have the cracking side we know that if we don't do anything, we just dump a whole bunch of wrap into our asphalt mixes, it's going to become very st stiff. Um, the, those H oxidized binder that are part of the wrap, that's going to lead to a big cracking problem. So here what we're going to do is we're going to engineer the mix so we don't have a writing problem and we don't have a cracking problem. The nice thing about this is the strategies are already there and available to us. We need to find that balance. So we often hear, oh my gosh, that, that, that roadway is old, that material is old, it's waste material, we can't do anything with it. Well, the reality is the rocks are really old from before we started to use them, and the binders are really old before we start to use them. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a question of how old this stuff is, it's really how do we best characterize the material that are, that's in that wrap. How do we characterize the rock? How do we characterize the binder that, that we can, we can um, utilize in that wrap material? It's a material characteristic we're looking at. It's not really, age has an effect on some of those characteristics, but it's not a matter of how old that road is. So when we look at those material characteristics, what are we looking at? Aggregate, the different types of aggregate. And typically in a wrap, um, Asphalt mixes are produced typically utilizing local materials. So your aggregate type are more often than not going to be very similar to the to the aggregates that are used in everyday mix production in your region. When we look at grad gradation, because as you saw, when we remove that pavement, it is milled out. Um, it can be a little bit more on the finer side. So we just have to address that in our gradations of, of the different uh, virgin aggregate components. And then finally, the binder characteristics. We know that the binder in, an, in a, a road that's come to the end of its life, it is definitely going to be stiffer due to oxidation um, from its in-service use. Oxidation is essentially where the environment, the heat, the sun, um, actually volatilizes some of the, the softer components of the binder, um, leading it to become stiffer higher viscosity, which means it's a it's a it's another sign of it being a stiffer stiffer binder. So what are we going to do from an engineering standpoint? Um, it's our mix design. We're going to account for the additional uh, fines in the gradation of asphalt mix. Uh, one of those things that we're going to look at is the gradation proportions. So it may require the an adjustment to the virgin aggregate gradations, um, their, uh, the proportions of the virgin aggregates to adjust for that finer material. Um, we need to adjust for uh, also uh, the workability. So one of the important aspects of um, the, the combination of material is how do we ensure that this mix that we put out on the road is going to be something that we can actually work we can move, we can place properly to ensure we get good density. 
And a lot of that is going to be the characteristics of the materials. And it may require some of the, the, the producers that want to provide a high quality, easily workable mix to uh, change the way that they that they manage and they actually produce their virgin aggregate materials for that. And sometimes that's done through um, an adjustment to the way they crush the material or the way they process maybe their fines and their sands. Um, so some of those types of things where you'll see producers start to change um, the way that they process their material all with at the end game of allowing them to better utilize the wrap and to create a wrap mix that is uh, high performing and that is easy to work with to ensure that you get proper construction. Also from the binder side, we need to account for that, uh, not just the binder content, which is pretty straightforward because, you know, the binder you're going to get that's in the wrap, you can go ahead and, um, and, and uh, get a credit for that and reduce the amount of virgin binder that you need. Uh, finally, uh, finally, when we look at um, account for uh, the wrap binder volume, we also look at the grade of that binder as well. Uh, binder quality, we look at the characteristics of the virgin binder compared to the characteristics of the wrap binder, and we look to see if we need to adjust the virgin binder. Um, that could be changing the grade, maybe utilizing a softer binder, or maybe looking at at some additives. Okay, it looks like we have a question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, Bryn? Yes. So um, Patrice sent in this question early on, and I think now maybe while you're talking about engineering solutions uh, might be a good time. So the General uh, Services Administration Federal announced the first ever national standards for clean concrete and asphalt that apply to all new GSA funded projects using more than 10 cubic yards of concrete and asphalt. Will this affect projects funded by the feds? Do agencies need to include anything new in the specs? Um, you know, I we are aware of that of that effort, the 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 GSA um, and what they've been what, what they're looking at implementing for materials. Uh, I don't think it's going to hit something that's going to be like tomorrow, but is it is something that uh, we are looking into, um, and that's that's something that you know as part of our climate stewardship um, action plan, really um, our roadmap forward. We're trying to address that, and we're we're also if you look at our efforts here in California with both local agencies and with Caltrans, we're trying to have the standards um, adjusted so we can meet those demands that we are see seeing from outside regulatory, even environmental. And so that's where we believe that increasing RAP and these types of things are going to um, are going to have to become a bigger, bigger part of our everyday paving operations. Um, and that's and the, the nice thing is, is when we look at something like RAP and some of the other uh, other strategies to address those types of of um, requirements. Um, more often than not, we've all, we're, we're already familiar. We already have solutions. We all we're already able to do that. It's just a matter of changing our standards to incorporate um, incorporate those those um, known processes and those known uh, solutions. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Patrice, I hope that helps answer. And I would urge you and everyone else to uh, tune in next week. We're going to really focus on concrete and and we can answer concrete questions about uh, how to increase uh, recycle content and uh, uh, meet some of those specifications. Very good. And, uh, hold on, let me see. Oh, my. Uh, would would using wrap and warm mixes qualify the HMA under their requirements? Um, I think we'd have to look at. I don't think it's a matter of just having some wrap and using a warm mix technology. 
it's it's interesting because yesterday we we uh, uh, two days ago we had actually a workshop where that that type of uh, discussion came up on on the overall use of and the GSA requirements um, and warm mix and stuff. Um, it's one thing to say, yeah, we're using it. It's another thing on how are we using it to actually get um, the benefits that we're achieving. So I think you have we have to look at not just how you know whether they're incorporated, but how they're incorporated. So I think using a high wrap mix um, with a warm mix that that results in a high wrap mix being placed being produced at much lower temperatures than we are today, I think that's that's really where the end goal is. Um, and then moving into uh, complete 100% recycled mixes as as you know we as I mentioned touch on very briefly at the beginning and we know granite rock is is heavily involved in those types of um, uh, 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 processes uh, for in place and central plant type recycling so I, I think that's where um, yeah we're going to have to make some significant changes and adjustments to our specifications um, so that we can involve evolve them to a to a way where we're actually achieving the goals that the GSA is really setting forth. Great, thanks. Uh, so carry on and we will get back to you with some more questions, Brandon, thank you. Great. So when we look at RAP, um, you know, we, we look at uh, the process of how we extract, recover and test the RAP binder proper properties um, when it's needed. What we typically find is when we have low wrap contents, let's say 10 to 20 percent, let's say that, you know, with Caltrans, we, we typically don't do much of anything when we have um, include 15 percent wrap. And that's because the research has shown that um, it's really not that the, the, the hardened wrap binder um, in a in with less than 15 percent wrap isn't really significant enough to need to adjust the overall mix. However, when we start to increase the wrap percentages, yes, we do need to uh, uh, address those uh, characteristics of that wrap binder. And we see that in the specification. Um, this was a, an NCHRP report that came out in the, I want to say in the 90s, and even was uh, carried on a little bit into the 2000s. But this has really been uh, some of the basis for the way the Caltrans standard specification is currently written is that under 15% really don't, do, we don't really, uh, you know, uh, require any adjustments to the mix for using up to 15% wrap. But when we get to 15 to 25% wrap, yeah, we do make an adjustment to the virgin binder using a soft virgin binder, softer virgin binder um, to, to mitigate the the stiffness in the wrap, and then we know that when we get 25 to 40 or or even higher percentages of wrap, we definitely have to uh, take that into account. So here's kind of what that recommendation came out with: um, really just one grade change between 16 and 25 percent, and that's really how our Caltrans specification is set up. And then when we get above 25 percent wrap, you know that's where we have to do a lot more. Um, uh, a lot more uh, uh, characterization of the wrap binder, the virgin binder, and making sure that we have a a mix that um, will meet the the demands of the project location and requirements. So the specifications that are typically used in California uh, is section 39, as well as the um, Caltrans section 39 and the um, city and county pavement improvement center. HMA LG specification. Uh, those are very similar in the sense that they're typical. They're the same format. The LG is something that is uh, was uh, developed by CCPIC for specifically for local agency usage. So it has some additional mixes in there that are more appropriate for the types of paving you'll see with a local agency. Let's say for residential paving or paving on on collectors and some arterials that the, the Caltrans section 39 spec just uh, does not does not include. Um, plus, there's some changes in regards to um, uh, the, the QA portion of, of the specification. 
those types of that those specifications include that that vi no change in the virgin binder grade and then adjusting the vi binder grade um, when you get between 15 and 25 percent and then the second uh, st standard used a lot here in california is the green book which really doesn't change the virgin binder between zero and 25 percent but when you get above 25 percent then it does require a blending charts and the use of recycling and that does allow the use of recycling agents just for a when we start to look at overall in the state the city of los angeles requires a minimum of 50 percent wrap minimum of 50 percent wrap typically they're in the 60 percent wrap range for all of their dense mixes uh, dense graded mixes in the city of Los Angeles, and they do uh, utilize recycling agents to to um, incorporate that wrap. Um, the tools are there in our toolbox. So I think it's a matter of us uh, taking advantage of them today so we can start increasing the use of wrap. Um, we know that using wrap results in a sustainable pavement or reducing the the need for virgin uh, resource material that's both the binder as well as the rocks that we use uh, we reduce waste from construction projects one of the sources of of some of the um uh, of the wrap is from not just from the roads but also from the plant during production uh, they have some material that is produced as they're getting the plant ready for a long for a run of of uh, spec mix going out to projects. Um, so they have materials that they are able to better utilize. Uh, we see a reduction of, of emissions for from um, the use of wrap in our pavements um, and we do have proven performance of it. Um, we have enough research and experience out there that shows that when when engineered properly these pavements will perform or outperform our conventional mixes so specification tools are in place we may need to make we need to take advantage of the research that's already out there and um, that will allow us to to move forward um, and help us achieve our uh, climate stewardship um, and our sustainability goals moving forward So once again, thank you very much for 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 the time and and um, if there's anything that we can do to assist you uh, for sharing some of this information on how to utilize RAP, please feel free to reach out to me. More than happy to um, to answer any questions and share the information that we have with you all. Thank you, as always, Brandon. Um, very interesting. Uh, a couple of plugs for April 21st, so two weeks from today. We're going to be talking about those mixed designs. Uh, we'll be talking about the tutorial agency Super Pave Mix and the Caltrans Super Pave um, in a couple of weeks, right? Good. And That's uh, true. so, you, any questions out there, guys? Um, you can raise your hand, type them in the chat. If you raise your hand, we'll we'll recognize you. I got folks out there. Do you have other questions out there? All right. Um, with that said, then I'll ask everybody to to stand up, take a break. Brandon, uh, thank you again, um, and uh, we will move into our next session. Our next session will focus on Granite Rocks Premium Sand Plant and what what it means to your mixes. This will be presented by Abel Covarrubias. He's our mine planner and a quarry engineer at Granite Rock. Abel is an engineer who currently serves as the mine planning engineer at Granite Rock's A.R. Wilson Quarry, if you guys have been out there. A Abel received his Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering from San Jose State and an associate degree of science and physics from Hartnell College. In his current role, he manages the short and the long-term mine plan of the quarry, oversees the quarry blasting operations, a job we all want, I suspect, the management and training of mining engineer personnel, and the management of various projects throughout, which include the premium sand plant, or PSP. Mr. Kovarivius has been with Granite Rock for over 23 years and served as an HMA research and technical services engineer a production quality engineer, engineering project manager, and has provided technical support for processing aggregate designing and implementing 
innovative mine planning technologies. Abel, good morning. You look great, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. You got to dress apart. All right. Well, you got them all fooled. So um, show them, <laughs> show off a little bit and tell us about this new um, new toy you got out there. All right. Let me bring out the presentation here. So uh, uh, Keith already kind of gave a uh, kind of uh, an overview of uh, my background there. So I just kind of uh, go uh, jump right into it. So um, let me see. Did you can you see my screen, uh, Keith? Yes, sir. OK, perfect. All right, uh, so we at Granite Rock uh, strive to improve the quality of our products to our customers uh, by providing distinct high quality products uh, to its distinct market. Um, kind of to kind of go over um, the review. So my uh, talking points for today is uh, a quick glance at the benefits of the PS, uh, PSP or the, the premium sand plant, uh, also known as the PSP. The issues uh, that can affect production quality and quantity in standard sand plants. Our previous SAN uh, system uh, versus our new SAN system with the PSP included, and then uh, a general functionality and operations of the PSP. So uh, here are the, the benefits uh, of the PSP. Uh, we now have the capability to optimize uh, the quality of our asphalt and concrete sands, increase our overall sand production capability, allows us to uh, more efficiently produce current products, uh, produce new products and open up the new door, new doors into our uh, sand, uh, other sand markets. Uh, quicker uh, dewatering, which means uh, reducing moisture to our customers and more efficient transportation, essentially uh, hauling more product and, and less water. Uh, we also benefit from the precise uh, waste and product separation. Um, it increases our ability to use wrap in our asphalt mixes, um, kind of. Um, if we look at the uh, at the premium sand plan, enables us uh, enables Granite Rock to produce a sand that has a gradation that implement uh, complements the gradation of wrap, so that the overall resulting combined gradation of the hot mix asphalt is evenly graded, pr uh, promoting workable and ease of compaction of the mix. Another great benefit uh, not listed here is also the plant's capability of producing uh, critical components for our uh, boutique blends. So that uh, it also includes like type two and type three slurries, uh, class uh, two uh, pre uh, permeable uh, base rock, and and other other products such as like ASTM number nine. Hey Abel, can I um, pause you just a minute and ask you a question? And this kind of relates back to what Brandon just talked about. And you right. listened to Brandon's talk? Yes, I did. Um, so you have increased our ability to use wrap. Why does this? allow us to use more wrap dovetailing on on the comments that that Brandon made right and then and uh if uh we we go a little bit uh, past on the on the presentation here um I'll, I'll probably kind of come a little bit more clear uh one Sorry. of the things I'll do is I'll I'll look at at the kind of the the kind of your basic sand plants and how they produce material and then also the capability of the new uh, premium sand plant how um we're able to to, to modify and actually reblend our product to be able to uh, minimize or 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 uh, kind of improve our blends to be able to be more capable to to accept more wrap and, and that kind of hopefully uh, become more apparent as I kind of uh, go through my presentation here. Great, sorry I stepped on your lines there. <laughs> no <ahead>. worries. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get there. So uh, I want I want to like to I, I want to start off by uh, going over some of the typical. Uh, uh, Product production issues, and finish off by going over some of the, the these issues and and how they are minimized or eliminated utilizing the the PSP sand plant. Many many issues can affect uh, product quality and quantity in sand plants that are still being uh, commissioned, as well as in plants that have been running for a very long time. Uh, with sta uh, standard types of plants, uh, such as a sand screw system, the the system could be rated. Uh, by the manufacturer uh, at a given capacity, but its actual capacity is limited by the maximum allowable content or certain parts of the gradation. For example, uh, typically looking at your feeds uh, particle size passing the number 50 mesh will determine at uh, what rate you're able to run your sand screws to meet uh, gradations uh, goals. So for an example, uh, uh, if your target gradation might uh, only allow for for about 250 tons per hour, even though the manufacturer rating is rated at fi uh, 500 tons per hour, 
uh, running only at 50% capacity to produce a given creation spec. So uh, running your 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 plant at a lower spec, I mean a lower uh, speed, uh, is might be necessary to be able to kind of get the 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 gradation that you're you're aiming for. So depending on your production demand, this might require another sand screw or work uh, two shifts to make a specific uh, specification requirement and keep uh, up with your uh, sales demand. Um, Custom plants would uh, typically be designed to handle the distribution of the particle size expected, but deposits are inherently var variable. So the deviation uh, may require a reduction in feed rate or a higher level of blending of coarse or finer sand to meet your target specifications. So uh, on the screen, I just have a, a quick little uh, kind of chart that is used to design a plant. And depending on on an example, what, what kind of uh, I just use sand screws as, as an example because that's our, our previous uh, plant system that we had before with the PSP. Uh, depending on what you rate is, um, you typically look at the number fifty mesh, and looking at the fifty uh, 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 number fifty mesh will require depending on what your your overall um, target gradation is at the number fifty. Um, it, it depends on how how fast you could run your your plant. So it has a, a, a an effect on your production, not only on the quality. So much depends on the feed, but also the type of process being used to create the products. It is also important to understand if there will be any issues with the product. Are there too many fines or too many coarse, uh, too much coarse material? Is there not enough uh, mid-size material or too much uh, mid-size material? Is the product failing? And, it, and if it's failing, is it uh, failing at the plant or is it uh, uh, failing at the customer's yard? Material handling can also affect the results. Softer materials that were inspect after being washed could suffer increased breakage due to transfer points and result in, in failing gradations. So sometimes, you know, you, you produce a, a, a material in spec, but, you know, based on, on how, how much you handle it, you know, you, by the time it gets to, to the customer, now you, you have a different gradation based off, off of breakdown. I have a uh, actually I have had the experience with this uh, recently, especially when dealing with natural occurring sands versus manufactured sands, where the natural sand product tends to to have more breakdown when uh, when uh, than the manufactured sand, which has gone through a vigorous process such as running through a crusher as part of the process. So in, in our experience, the, the number one thing that knocks a product out of spec is the feed material. Uh, this is the first thing to check if you are out of spec. Uh, consider the following factors. Uh, are you in, in a new mining area? Uh, has the strata in the deposit changed? Um, has, the, has the feed process changed? Has the feed rate increased? Is the blend feed uh, incorrect? So these are the things to, to, to look, look into. Uh, some sands, uh, some plants are designed to simply uh, wash out the, uh, the excess number 200 mesh, so they will not address excess of uh, or lack of other fractions. So, particularly uh, sand screws, um, you have a good handle on how much 200 you want to include into your mix, um, but really don't have that much flexibility on other other uh, other than the uh, you know adjusting the number 50, like explained earlier in the previous slides. In more sophisticated plants. With the ability to uh, reblend a, a coarse or finer stream, uh, getting the material back into spec could be as simple as moving the blend gate. Uh, but this is uh, typically a broad adjustment that uh, includes the ent uh, entire gradation spectrum and not just a group of individual particle sizes. In the most sophisticated plants, such as those using a recipe or a fractionation principle, such as the PSP, uh, the automated blend programming will uh, typically address these issues and adjust online or on real time. So those are the benefits there for the PSP. So let's look at a, our previous plant system versus our new premium, Sam. So before the PSP, our, our sand uh, process utilized only, one sand, uh, only sand screws to fractionate the raw feed in parts. Each time the, the feed is fractionated, it is called a stage. The, the stage screw, uh, the sand screws only provide us with one stage and a one cut. Uh, what this means is that uh, at the end of the process, we end up with two parts, our sand product and our waste. 
the benefits of this is super simple. Uh, that is super simple and can just about uh, you, you can just about set it and then you forget about it. The downside is that you get out, uh, get what you get. So, so um, it's so simple that it isn't a lot of adjustments and it doesn't make very precise cuts. Two different raw feeds uh, will result in two different sand gradations if not detected on time or setting uh, or settings are not adjusted um, on a timely manner. This chart uh, demonstrates how each fraction a uh, fraction uh, fraction a stage makes a cut on the gradation. The first column represents the component of the sand. This is uh, this is all the different sizes uh, granules of the sand found within the gradation. The second column represents the proportion of each component. In this example, we have a sand gradation which uh, has 11% uh, passing the number eight, 27% passing the number 16, and then 23% passing uh, uh, the number 30, and so on. The right column represents the, the fraction, uh, fractionation stage. Remember in our sand system, uh, our sand screws, we can only make one cut. Theref uh, therefore, we only have one stage shown in yellow. This stage makes a, a, a cut between our product and our waste. But what if we needed to adjust the gradation? What if we needed a, a sand that had more number four through 16s or less 200s to have the ability to add uh, more wrap in our mixes? With sand screws, uh, you have minimum adjustment capability. Essentially, the only two variables you have to make uh, to play with is uh, is the rotational speed as as described and the raising uh, and the rising current uh, flow rate, which is an unprecise adjustment. Uh, this uh, chart demonstrates the purpose of the uh, premium sand plant. Instead of just one stage and one sand, we now have the four stages nearly an unlimited amount of sand blending options. Uh, the, four uh, the four stages are named after the fractionational process. Uh, first stage is called the grit screen, which combines the number four and 16 uh, component sizes. Then you have the primary stage, which combines the number 30 through 50. Then you have uh, the secondary stage, which uh, separates the 100s. And then you have the tertiary stage, which separates the 200 component. You, ha also, uh, you can also see that uh, we can make uh, five uh, five cuts unique to the PSP. We have a cut on the course end of the gradation to remove any potential contaminants. Uh, with four separate stages, uh, uh, we can group and separate each of the components of the feed into four separate bins. Uh, from there, we can uh, put the components back together in, in recipe-based uh, proportions to create a custom desired product. This uh, diagram uh, shows the basic principle used in the premium sand plant. Uh, we fractionate the components uh, uh, with the use of rising current. Uh, the heavier components fall, settle down to the bottom, while the rising current, uh, the lighter uh, components float over to the top into the next, uh, next stage. So the, the green sinks uh, and the rest go over, then the red sinks and the rest go over and so on. You could see the, the different stages. So essentially where you're, you're you're dropping out the coarser particles as you kind of uh, make your way through the process. The PSP is broken up into three levels. Uh, we have our uh, fractionation uh, fractionation level uh, is uh, simply the this, the settling tubes I described on the last slide, uh, which uh, includes the following equipment. We have grid screens, uh, hydrosizers, and separators. Then you have the the blending stage which uh, are the, the dosing bins that uh, each of the components are stored in. Then we have the dewatering uh, uh, sta uh, stage, uh, and it's where we're the, we remove the free water from the sand prior to stockpiling. Then we have the, the grid stage. We have the primary stage, the secondary stage, and a, tert a tertiary stage. And those are, are making the, the four bins, the four different uh, particle breaks in our gradation. So the first process uh, uh, equipment that the feed goes through is the grid screen. Uh, if it if it is uh, if it is oversized, 
Then it goes uh, to the con con contamination bin. The material that uh, is too large to fall through the bottom deck goes into the first dosing bin, uh, which we call dosing bin A. This is what we uh, call the grit and is uh, the coarsest component of our, our, uh, our bins, which is a, a size range of somewhere between uh, number four and 16. Everything smaller uh, than that, the grit material falls through the bottom deck and into a uh, sump tank. This material is then pumped back up and enters into the next stage, which we call the primary stage. These are the separators, uh, the core cyclone, uh, the coarse uh, cyclone down along the inner uh, wall, while the fines are pulled up to the middle through the vortex. One of the greatest benefits of this technology is the pre precise, the precision in the cut between uh, component sizes. This results in nearly no product remaining in the waste. And these are the dosing bins. Uh, dosing bins. The dosing bins are the containers that hold the fraction, uh, fractionated material. So uh, we have uh, four bins, like I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, bin A, which holds the number 4 through 16, B, which holds the number uh, 30 through 50, then bin C, uh, which holds the 100, and then D, which has the 200 uh, mesh. So the dewatering screens is the next uh, section, uh, removes the free water from the product uh, prior to conveyance and stockpiling, uh, expedites the drying process, and product can be shipped and handled immediately. So uh, this this is a, a I know it's a, it's a big issue when when you uh, freshly make new product and it uh, and it's you know dealing with you know high moisture content. Um, one of the benefits of having dewatering screens is now you will be able to you know ship it almost immediately uh, after it is processed. So uh, what's really amazing about this product is that uh, transform, uh, the transformation it has uh, had from nearly a waste product to now a premium feed. Not, not only is the product highly durable and has low absorption and high uh, specific gravity, it all has less waste. So what we're utilizing here is, is, uh, is our uh, crusher finds. Our crusher finds are, are made on our, uh, uh, as you know, as essentially what it, what it, what it is, 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 uh, is all the finds uh, through our crushing process. So got, having gone through a vigorous crushing process, this material has uh, less breakdown through the material handling process than natural occurring sands as described uh, previously. So now that we have, have talked about the, the feed, the plant and the, and the waste, let's talk about the products that we are producing. So, uh, so the three main main products uh, that, that we talked about uh, when dealing with the PSP is the premium asphalt sand, we have the concrete sand, and then we have the fill sand. Oh, let's see here. So here, here are the ingredients uh, produced by the PSP that we can utilize to make a variety of different types of sand. Uh, the product feed uh, converted into uh, coarse to fine fractions. So if you look at the bottom, like look at this, this is the, 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 the uh, PSP feed. This is what we're feeding the, the, the plant with. And as it goes through the different stages, you have your, what we call the grit material, which is a, in a, bin A. Then we got the primary stage, which is bin B. Then we got the, the secondary stage, which is C. And then you have the, the 200s, which is in bin D. You can see how, how, how clean each fraction is and how it's unique to, to each bin. So I, I use these as an example. So, um, so now that, that you're, you're able to fractionate the material, now you could go ahead and proportion it uh, at, at multiple different recipes, right? So not only can you make asphalt sand, you can make pretty much any any type of material that uh, your heart's desire that are broken up in these four stages. So an example here is is like if you're trying to make asphalt sand, uh, you know, it's essentially like baking a cake. You you put in you know your quantities that you need for each bin, and uh, as long as it, it it provides the 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 spec that you're trying to target, uh, and then and essentially there you'd be able to make any product you you desire. 
So here's an example of the difference between a, an asphalt sand and a concrete sand is, uh, is the different blend percentages that you're able to uh, produce based off this plant. So uh, just in, and as an example, uh, some customers uh, have unique needs and, and requests. Uh, a certain request was to, to provide a high permeable, uh, durable product that could be used uh, between pavers. Uh, the goal was to maintain permeability, but leave the tightest uh, joints possible for aesthetics. To, to be really uh, competitive, it needed to be as fine as possible. His dream uh, uh, product was in our crusher finds, but we just didn't have an efficient way to, to get it out until we came uh, until the PSP was developed. And so it's pretty pretty uh, 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 amazing in terms of you know where we were before and the capability that we had in making uh, you know uh, boutique products versus what we have today using the PSP. So uh, just to sum it up, uh, we uh, what we have done here is that we maximize the value of our limited resources uh, one ton at a time. Uh, we got the plant fractionated, the feed, premium feed, and the product blending and recipes. So making it better, maximizing the value of our limited resources one ton at a time. And that concludes my presentation. Fantastic, Fantastic Gable. Gable. Um, what do you do with the minus 200s? So the minus 200s, so so the way, one thing that I didn't describe on the plant is is one of the, um, so we have three dewatering screens down at the bottom and uh, two of them are actually specific for, for making two different products, right? And and just for, for obviously we can make different products, but you know, just uh, for simplification, you have your concrete and your asphalt sand, all right? So one is dedicated for concrete, one is uh, designated for uh, asphalt. The third third sample, I mean, the third uh, dewatering screen handles uh, any oversize. So any anything that for some reason you're making a product and you have any any excess material that did not make it into the concrete or did not make it into uh, make it into the um, into the asphalt, it, it goes into the fill sand, and so that allows us to make a, a, a third product. And essentially, would be able to handle all the excess 200s that are not required in any of the other other mixes uh, being produced at the time. Thank you, Patrice, and thank you uh, for the answer. Thanks for the question. And other questions out there, you guys, you can put them in the chat or just raise your hand. Um, Abel, in in sort of layman's terms, I heard this this PSP work um, as if it were a coin counter. That, that the different sizes would just drop in through the holes, the different holes, and you'd be able to segregate, um, which made, for me, the, a layman, uh, made a lot of sense. Um, any other things that you can kind of say in plain speak about um, uh, what this PSP will mean to, to folks out there um, in their mixed designs? And well, essentially, um, we have the capability uh, of providing uh, providing unique products. Um, you know, having the capability of uh, segregating uh, into bins, it pretty much fractionating your 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 raw product into three bins, and then being able to kind of recipe back together um, gives us a whole variety of different um, capabilities out there. So, you know, somebody wants a, a, a unique product. We'd probably be able to provide that where other uh, other um, competitors uh, don't have that uh, capability currently. Thank you, Abel. This is uh, Robert. Um, question here: How does someone reach out to Granite Rock to request a custom blend from the Premium Sand Plant? I, I believe that would go through the the sales uh, department, but somebody could probably answer that one better than I can. Yeah, I think we we would go eight three one seven six eight twenty three eighty, and and uh, we do have a lab available that can can uh, create all kinds of mixed designs for you um, in in all three disciplines, as it were, in aggregate, asphalt, and in concrete. Uh, any other questions out there for you, folks? That was an interesting presentation. And uh, how's it working for you today, Abel? Is, is the PSP out there uh, outperforming for you? 
Yeah, you know, currently right now, uh, oh, we're in a unique situation right now at, at the at the quarry. So uh, um, we we, we kind of using it sparingly, sparingly right now, but uh, hopefully in the next month or so, uh, we're going to be able to uh, up the the production on this. So Good. we're in a unique situation right now, but but you know we'll get it up and running soon. As soon as we get you off of this thing, you're going to go back out there and and change clothes and go go make that thing sing. Yeah, exactly. Good. Good. All right. Well, if there's any other questions, please get them in here last minute. And to wrap up, thank you again, uh, Brandon Millar and Abel Kovarubius. Uh, really interesting and useful information today. Thank you all out there for joining us today. We appreciate your participation and it, hoping that it was uh, of use to you. Please don't forget to take our survey on this session. Uh, there will be a general question. If you've got some other topics out there you'd like us to find experts in, uh, we'd be happy to bring those to you and how we can improve this session. We will see you here next week, Thursday, April 14th, to further expand your knowledge. Next week, we're going to be talking about green concrete. So, Patrice, a little bit about how you can still uh, meet those requirements from the feds. Uh, in the concrete side, and environmental product declarations, uh, an important component in uh, any of your reporting out there. It'll be the same time uh, next week, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., and that concludes today's Tech Talk. Please be safe out there, everyone, and rock on. Thank you.